This rather sad looking railway viaduct behind me means a lot to me, you know, because right from being a very small boy, I used to go climbing in the in the iron girders when I was about eight years old. And when a locomotive came along with a load of coal wagons on, the whole lot used to shake about. In foggy days, there's a little ledge up there that had what were, just looked like a sentry box. And this guy was sat there all night long with a big coat brazier in front of him and the fog signals. And you stick up on the track and every time the engines come, bang, 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 you know, it were really exciting times in a way. Before this road appeared, the valley were about 50 or 60 foot deeper and the River Crow, which is still down there somewhere underneath the road, used to flow along the bottom. From the very earliest times, man has had this problem of getting across rivers. The first bridges were very simple affairs, but by the Middle Ages they were getting much more ambitious. Even then they were limited by the length of the arch that they were able to build. Then in 1741, Europe's first wrought iron suspension bridge was built over the River Tees. The basic principle of suspending a path or a roadway from cables rather than building one on top of arches meant that wider spaces could be crossed. The idea was taken up very rapidly, but it was not until the 1820s that advances in the design and manufacture of wrought iron chains made it possible for Thomas Telford to build his two great suspension bridges in North Wales. When it was opened in 1826, the Menai Bridge was by far the longest suspension bridge in the world. Telford's original wrought iron chains have now been replaced by steel chains. So I went to have a look at the Conway Bridge where all the original wrought iron is still in place. Telford surveyed quite a few places around Conway for his bridge, but he selected this place here near the castle because the rock for the anchors, the anchor chambers, was superior to anywhere else and there were plenty of it. It, it started in 1822 when the first stones were laid and then they, they got the chains across in rather an unconventional way. They, they built a, a rope, ornery rope bridge first and started from each end advancing towards the centre. It must have been a bit nervy with all that tonnage resting on ornery ropes and then finally the middle pin went in and the things, once they got the chains across, it was quite a simple job putting the vertical bolts or bars down to the road surface and building the road on it. And in all, it took a little more than four years, I think, to construct. All the ironwork was made in a workshop in Shrewsbury and basically each chain consists of five bars about 10 feet long by about four by about an inch and quarter thick, with an eye forged on each end. And they're all held together by fish plates that are spaced in between them, and then two great bolts slam through the lot about three inches diameter. And it's certainly a good bit of drilling and fixing. It, it sort of stood the test of time. Thomas Telford was one of our greatest civil engineers. He built roads, bridges and canals. But one of his most dramatic engineering feats is this thousand feet long aqueduct which carries the Shropshire Union Canal across a valley high above the River Dee near Clangothlan in North Wales. 19 arches, each with a span of 45 feet, carry the waterway over in a cast iron trough. We're now about to go over <laughs> Mr. Telford's famous aqueduct. Uh, I've read a lot about it and seen it on postcards and all. And the sides are very thin, made of cast iron. 
number one, it would be better if I got it lined up right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> How much space have we got on each side? When the boat's on it, you got about about three inches. Yeah. Three four inches. Yeah, well, we're going to bump into the side here. Here we go. When exactly were it completed, like? Uh, you know, when were it built? Well, it started at the 1795. Yeah. And it was completed 1805. Yeah, yeah. And when it, when it, when it must have been a wonderful feeling, uh, you know, when they first did it, when they first filled it yeah. up with water and they left it, didn't they, for quite some time to see if it uh, leaked, leaked or anything. anything terrible happened. Yeah, what is it? How far? Oh, 100 and... Uh, it's 126 feet at yeah. the highest point yeah. above the River Dee. See, they're all sandstone mm. yeah. pillars coming up. The I actual arch is a cast iron as well, cast aren't iron, they? Yeah. Cast iron, yeah. Cast iron arch. Yeah, yeah the rails, the arches. Mm. Under the towpath is all, it's all cast yeah. iron. Mm. They ever empty so it for they painting do empty, purposes? Yes, they have emptied it to do uh, maintenance. Some winters, when you get a very hard winter, oh, wow, they have to break the ice on it. Oh, wow, yeah, Otherwise, yeah, it would push, could, push the yeah. sides out. If it did freeze, it would not do it any good. No. no. Um, no. Mm. If you're just emptying the aqueduct, yeah. it's about three hours, yeah. just, just the aqueduct. How big is the, the bungalow? It's probably about a couple of feet, if yeah. that. Mm. foot and a half, two foot square. Yeah. Mm, well, it's fairly big. Big then. waterfall right down into the River Dee yeah, down below. Yeah, yeah. But it's a rare sight, that, when it's gushing out. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had so much in it's running over the edge? No, because there's yeah. actually a weir on the far yeah. end of yeah. the aqueduct. Mm -hmm. So if there's any excess water, it runs over the yeah. weir again, yeah. down the sluice in, into yeah. the River Dee. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's never never yeah. run over the top. I wonder what these other holes were for. In top. I don't know. It never, ever had a rail on, yeah, as far as yeah. we know. Yeah. It might, be, it might have been for another rail. Yeah. But yeah. Unless it was part of the casting when they yeah, casted it. Yeah. Now then, this bridge, this this aqueduct, has got a very strange name that I can't pronounce, has, so yeah. I'm going to let you do it. Yeah. It's called the Pont Casutli Aqueduct. The Pont Casutli Aqueduct. Yes. I knew I'd get it right. <laughs> Bit of practice. Yeah. Look, there's another boat coming. There's one coming yeah, this way now, yeah. 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 He will be uh, waiting for it to come off. The building of Britain's canal network in the 18th and early 19th centuries left us with a legacy of great engineering projects. As well as aqueducts to get across valleys, they also had the problem of getting up and down hills. If they came to a small hill, they'd dig a cutting. If they came to a longer hill with a plateau on top, they'd build locks up one side and down the other. And if they came to a big hill, they'd build a tunnel through it. This is the Dudley Tunnel, which was opened in 1792 to connect Dudley with the Birmingham Canal. Modern canal boats have got engines, but of course, in the olden days, they had horses. And what did you do with the horse when you come to a tunnel like this? Well, it's quite simple, really. They uh, used to either let the horse wander over the top of the hill itself, or one of the um, boat crew would lead it over, mm. one of the kids maybe, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, they'd have to uh, use manpower to get the mm, boats yeah. through. What, 70 tonne of tackle? Mm. Yeah, well, there'd probably be about 30 tonne of goods yeah. in the boat, and the boat yeah. would probably weigh about 10 or 15 tonnes. Yeah. The one method was to use a boat shaft and push on the roof of the mm. tunnel and walk along the cargo, but that used to wear the bricks away. So the canal company owners um, preferred them to use the art of legging. Things have changed a bit, from yeah. where people got paid to do the legging, to yeah. where people pay us to let them do the legging. Oh, oh, do you want to have a go? Oh, everyone, yes. Oh, we've yeah. got a legging board here. Right. Put the legging board across the middle of the boat. And this is where we have to get friendly, uh, Fred. Oh, yes. <laughs> mm, how's that? Nice. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> OK. Look down oh, flat. like that. Yeah. yeah. Right. OK. That's yeah. where we're going, towards push, the... Push your feet towards the stern end of the boat, yeah. towards the cabin. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, hey, the wall's going further away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're doing a fur rate or not, aren't we? Yeah. 
That's so, what I don't you, fancy it for about two miles. <laughs> so you don't want to do it for a living then? <laughs> no, it's going to be a traction engine driver. Yeah. They used to yeah. cheat a little bit. They, yeah. uh, they'd sometimes tie three or four boats together. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and once they yeah. got them going, they yeah. just keep them going and they'd, they'd earn yeah. three or four times the money. I think my cap's falling off. <laughs> <laughs> in lots of ways, it's a lot harder to build a canal than a motorway, isn't it? When you think of, you know, they've got to get water across valleys and all of that. I mean, really, I suppose the credit goes to the guys that actually built all, mm. all of this. Mm. The main canals, they got people working that they call navvies or navigators because they were building a, a waterway. Mm. Though I suspect when, the, when it came to the tunnels, they, they got more skilled labour in mm. to do that. Yeah. Yeah, light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> keep running in the air, you keep it going, you see. The name stayed with the navvies, and throughout the 19th century, there was much more work for them building the railways. It was an age of massive engineering projects. Isambard Kingdom Brunel tunnelled under the Thames at Rotherhithe, the first time anybody had ever tried to tunnel under such a vast expanse of water. Then when he was building his Great Western Railway in the 1830s, he crossed the river at Maidenhead on the longest and flattest arch he's ever built, a record that still stands today. It was the coming of the railways that really pushed forward the development of bridges. And as the 19th century progressed, bridge building became more daring and dramatic, but it wasn't without its mishaps. The Tay Bridge was opened in 1878, but one year later it collapsed in a storm just as a train was crossing over it. The engine and all its carriages plunged into the river below and all 75 people on board lost their lives. The bridge's designer, Thomas Bouch, had already drawn up plans for a bridge across the Firth of Forth but after the disaster they were dropped pretty rapidly and a new design was sought. The bridge that was constructed was the greatest engineering wonder of the Victorian age. The design of the fourth bridge incorporated two major innovations, the use of steel and the cantilever principle. Three great piers were built and on these they erected steel towers. From the towers, the six cantilever arms were built out on both sides. By the time it was completed in 1890, it was the wonder of its age. I would have loved to have seen it when steam trains used to come thundering across and to have been able to get up there on the girders with one of the painting gangs. It all looks so very exciting. Now the bridge carries 150 trains a day, but most of them are just little diesels. It's now 110 years old and a major refurbishment is underway, which gave me the chance to have a good look at it. When you climb on the fourth bridge, it's amazing when you think how the great cantilevers are not really mechanically connected at all. In order to allow for the contraction and expansion, they are just linked up together like a chain. And, if you're not careful, they do and it's because of this, of course, that when you stand on the very top of it, 350 feet up in the sky, and a locomotive comes onto the bridge under the cantilevers, you can feel the whole thing rock. It was quite a fantastic feeling up on there, and a credit to the men who built it, and all that based on the cantilever principle. So let's have a practical demonstration of how it works. Really, this is the principle of the cantilever bridge, right? very similar to the fourth bridge. And whether Mr Fowler did anything like this or not, I don't know. <laughs> As you can see, I mean, it's supporting the wall weight of my wife here with not too much effort. I mean, if I were replaced by a girder, uh, or one up and one down, it would be, with struts supporting in the middle, it would be quite successful, you know. Um, and it's creaking a bit, but it's, uh, it's holding the weight. <laughs> this bit here, in the sort of left hand, is the cantilever. And of course, 
this other bit is, is the counterbalance that, you know, actually stops the thing from falling over. Come to London to look at another great Victorian engineering feat. Tower Bridge, built at the end of the 19th century. Inside that great castle-like exterior, there's a great big steel frame that were constructed by the same men who built the fourth bridge. Before the Victorian age, there had never been a bridge downstream of London Bridge, but the massive growth in the population in the East End made a new one essential. The problem was that this stretch of the river had some of London's busiest docks, and any new bridge would have to give up to an 140-foot clearance for tall ships. The solution came from Horace Jones, the city architect, with his design for Tower Bridge. It took eight years to build, and five major contracting companies, and the relentless labour of 500 men. And about, there's about 11,000 tonnes of steel in the, in the towers and the walkways and the roadways. On the completion of the steelwork, it was clad in Cornish granite and Portland stone, both to protect the ironwork and give it the beautiful appearance that it has now. Yeah, when you come inside one of the towers, you know, you can see it's great steel skeleton that's all riveted together. The whole thing would stand up, really, without the fancy stonework or the beautification on the outside. It's a wonderful bit of ironwork, really. Let's do some riveting. The bridge is hydraulically operated, and a lot of the original machinery can still be seen in the engine rooms, including these beautiful steam engines that once powered the hydraulic pumps. The energy that was created was stored in six massive accumulators like this, so that as soon as the power was required to lift the bridge, it was readily available. Great engineering didn't end with the Victorians, and just downstream from Tower Bridge, there's a fine example of a more recent engineering feat. Over the last 20 years, there's been some pretty impressive engineering achievements two of which have been the Channel Tunnel and the Thames Barrier here behind me. This unique piece of engineering spans the Woolwich Reach and it's 520 metres from this side to the other. And basically it consists of 10 large gates that are supported on great concrete piers and abutments which the, the gates actually swivel round in, you know, when they're needed. And the, the, the piers also contain all the machinery for activating the thing in case of emergencies. Each of the four main gates weigh 3,700 tonnes, and when they're open, they stand as high as a five-storey building and as wide as Tower Bridge. It took 4,000 men and women from all over Britain to construct it, and it took eight years, and it cost nearly 500 million pounds. Most people won't really know where we are, Martin, will we? They don't expect like tunnels like this on the lock gates and no, all. That's uh, right. Well, this is the uh, the concrete sill. We're actually in the sill. Yeah. And these the main reason for the tunnels is to give us access to the piers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the sills there, like the the door frame for the yeah. gate. Yeah. So the gate can always open and close in and out of this yeah. concrete mm. sill. Mm -hmm. Right. I think there's two, there's two of these, isn't there? One on each side of the all of it that the gate sits in when it's shut, when it's open. That's right. Uh, yeah. The yeah. two tunnels are to give us duplicate services, so they yeah. both carry power yeah. and water for firefighting. Yeah. So that if one flooded, we could still close yeah. the barrier yeah. using yeah. the other. Yeah. This is the, uh, the machinery room, and here are the big hydraulic rams, which actually we use mm. to close and open the gates. And when we pump the hydraulic oil in, they push and pull, mm -hmm. pull on the link yeah. to rotate the gate. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that. This is an interesting bit, isn't it? This uh, great crank that makes the thing go round, eh? Yeah, this is uh, connected to the other end of the hydraulic cylinders, which you saw inside. Mm -hmm. So as the hydraulic cylinders push and pull, mm -hmm. it rotates this rocking beam, mm -hmm. which is connected to the, the yeah. gate arm, mm -hmm. 
and that rotates the whole gate out of the sill. Yeah, yeah. The 3,600 tonnes yeah. comes rising up to close out the yeah. tide. If there's a spring tide and strong easterly wind mm -hmm. and a low pressure, they all combine to create a higher than normal tide, mm. and that's when we need to go into closure mode. We've actually closed 33 times like, to protect London from flooding. We can actually close the barrier in 15 minutes, but that's a bit dangerous because you can create like a water hammer effect yeah, on the yeah, Thames. Oh, yeah. So we like to take two hours to close. And the, uh, the notch level around the, uh, the pier there, yeah. that's the height of the walls mm -hmm. upriver towards yeah. London. Yeah, so and you know uh, if it's getting near there, uh, things are getting a bit dodgy. That's right, we need to be closed if it's getting near the, uh, the notch. The width of the piers, or the width of the gates, is the same as Tower Bridge. Mm -hmm. And that's this uh, internationally known design, so that anybody who builds a, a boat which is Bigger wider than, than this, yeah. it won't fit through here, yeah, it won't it fit won't through Tower Bridge. London, yeah. That's right, it won't fit through the Panama Canal, all yeah. these kind of mm. issues. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. The Thames Barrier isn't really a bridge or a tunnel but it's a great piece of engineering that combines elements of each. Building it had been a major challenge, but within a year, engineers had started to draw plans for an equally ambitious project, a tunnel under the channel. There had been a variety of attempts to link England and France by tunnel, but it wasn't until the 1980s that the British and French governments agreed to the Channel Tunnel Link. It opened in 1994, and it's actually made up of three tunnels. Two are for the trains, and the third is a central service tunnel. Work on the tunnel started in December 1987, and they cut their way under the channel with these huge tunnel boarding machines. It took three years before the British and French tunnelling teams achieved the first historic breakthrough and another four years before it was ready to open. The whole thing is a wonderful piece of civil engineering, but unlike bridges, there's not a great deal of it you can see. So to see the latest in bridge building design and construction, I went back north to the River Umber. In the 1960s and 70s, Britain led the world in the design and, and building of suspension bridges. And this bridge over the Umber behind me, at the time of its building, was the biggest in the world. Alas, it's hard to say, the good old Japanese have built one bigger. Work began in 1973 and it took eight years to complete and over thousands and thousands of tons of wire and concrete were used and over a thousand people were engaged in its construction over like various periods of activity. The towers are 533 feet high and I was taken up to the top by Roger Evans, the bridge master. <laughs> Here we are, 500 feet above the River Umber. What, you know, how the heck did they start with the first wire light sort of thing? It starts with, with a couple of men in a boat actually yeah. lying a, a wire rope on the bottom of the river, taking it over the top of the other tower yeah. and then pulling it tight so yeah. you get it up. And then uh, when you can get several of them across, you can put a, a mesh on top of it to make a walkway. Yeah. So yeah. That you've got like a catwalk. That must have been a pretty early business, eh? You know, with well, a, I wasn't there. few wires and no doubt like dog clips holding a bunch of wires, eh? You know, as they advanced out across. Would like a gale like this sort of stop work, I should imagine, uh, you know? Yeah, when, when it's, it's getting near that level. Cause, um, yeah. When, you, when they're actually working with the cable spinning, they've got yeah. the wheel pulling the, the wires across that way yeah. at 30 miles an hour, and then a crosswind maybe 40 miles an hour blowing sideways yeah. on, so um, it has a business. Yeah, and that's, of course, it took a lot longer as a result. How so, long is it from end to end? It's about a mile and a half between yeah. the two anchorages. Yeah, yeah. 
So if you actually think how much wire that is, when you go and you've got 15,000 wires going a mile and a half, it's a lot of wire. Yeah, there's enough to go nearly twice around the world. Yeah. He looks quite fragile, really, but, you know, I mean, I know there's many hundreds of tons. How much weight yeah. is there in, in uh, the actual bridge? Well, the, the cables themselves weigh 11,000 tons, so the first job yeah. they've got to do is support yeah, their own the weight. Selves, yeah, yeah, and then you've yeah. got uh, 17,000 mm. tons of road deck. Yeah. Mm. And uh, if, we've, if we've got a good day, we've got yeah. 6,000 tonnes of traffic yeah. on there, so oh, really? we're, we're talking yeah. big figures. Ah, so these, these pillars really are really under some compression, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, mighty compression. Well, right? that's why they can bend so much. Yeah. Because they, they start off with a massive compressive yeah. force in them. Yeah, so yeah. when yeah. they bend, yeah. you don't yeah. get cracks forming you know, in the tension uh, side. Am I right or am I wrong? In, I felt distinctly that the, the things were moving when we came yeah. out to that door. Well, you know, I, actually, I can feel it here. I'm yeah, leaning yeah, yeah, on this, and the yeah, tires move yeah, slightly yeah. in this direction. Yeah. I mean, at 500 yeah. feet, you know, they've got to do, haven't they? But, well, yeah. it's designed, at where we're standing, yeah. it's designed to move two feet either way. Them great cables that go from one side of the Umber estuary to the other, what most people don't realise is there are 14,000 pieces of wire forming a cable two feet diameter which is unbelievable tensile strength, you know, like 10 times what Mr. Telford's wrought iron bars have got. It's not actually 14,000 separate pieces, it's one piece that traverses the wall width of the river from this anchor chamber here, up, over, down, up and over and down, and back again 200 times, making it like 400 passes in all. And, and each of these 400 bungles is about that big and they, they, they all fan out in this great chamber. Like this great mass of wires, like rays of sunlight, coming from like a funnel up near the top. Like how many tons of concrete is it all anchored to? Well, yeah, we're, we're in the middle of about 300,000 tons yeah. of mass and yeah. uh, 20,000 tons yeah. of pull, trying to yeah. drag this 30,000 ton lump yeah, yeah, towards yeah. the river in that direction. Mm. How many bits of wire is there, you know, like, well, all you're, together? You're looking at 15,000 bits. Yeah. Um, 22 and a half thousand miles. And then, of course, these wonderful bolts that hold it all down. Like, there are, there are like, 12, isn't there, little ones that they go through this great That's block. right. Like, really, you'd think that when you look at that lot there, you'd think it were almost impossible to compress it mm. into a two-foot diameter iron rope, uh, well, yeah. steel rope. Yeah, it's... I always think that. And it's from these slender-looking cables that the whole weight of the road is suspended. Next on BBC Two, discover the secrets of our ancient woodlands with Alan Titchmarsh and the nature of Britain. <laughs>